All right, good morning uh, again. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to take a look at some of the equipment that you may encounter in uh, the field uh, while working um, in the what I always call uh, telecommunication uh, business. So, of course, the main, main uh, thing that you would probably come across would be installing data cables, and that's running cables in the wall, suspending them on independent J-hooks. And I am going to tell you something about that. The um, All the wiring that's data, intercom, telephone, all that so-called extra low voltage wiring, because believe it or not, that uh, 120, 120 volts, 15 amps or 20 amps or whatnot, the house wiring, it's considered as low voltage wiring, okay? So now the data, signal wires, microphones, speakers, uh, wiring, um, alarm, and such uh, is uh, considered as extra low voltage. Now, that extra low voltage is not as, uh, as far as the wiring, is not as strict as the low voltage electrical wire, the household wiring or commercial uh, service cabling. However, there are some rules that, uh, that need to be followed. Like, for example, all the wiring has to be independently suspended, which means do not tie any of the wiring to the rods, the suspending rods that hold the frame onto which the ceiling tiles are mounted. That's a big no-no. Um, the reason for that is, uh, well, believe it or not, fire regulations. Um, the, reason, and the reasoning behind that, why is this fire regulations, is that in case of fire, uh, the firemen, firewomen, fire personnel, okay, let's say that, is uh, they're going to enter uh, the facility and they're going to try to tear some of these things down, pulling uh, and, and pulling down the ceiling um, framing is uh, part of this part of their job. Um, now. When they're trying to hook onto the ceiling tiles framing and there's some other things tied to it, then it just makes their job a little bit more difficult and, uh, well, uh, it adds to the hazards uh, or the danger of this job. Right? So that's why it has been decided that all the wiring has to have independent suspension. So you're either tying, tying, um, you are either tying the wiring to the so-called red iron, and that's the uh, well, kind of a triangular shape uh, suspension of, uh, which is pretty much at the little bit below or attached to even to the true ceiling, which is the ceiling above the ceiling tiles. It's a steel kind of a construction, and it's usually painted red, so that's why we call this thing red iron. Uh, or using things that are called J-hooks, and those J-hooks that, uh, are, well, we can see them mounted on the wall in our lab. So J-hooks can be mounted on the walls or can be mounted on the threaded rods or otherwise suspension that's attached to the either uh, true ceiling or the uh, red iron. And there are different attachments you can do. So that's what... Uh, now... That's what you know. It's supposed to be done. Uh, however, I can still see because once in a while I do a still job. You know, once you do that kind of stuff, you never stop. People keep calling you. So once in a while, I do have the pleasure of uh, of participating or taking up, uh, taking on uh, a small independent project. And I can see still people are tying those wires left and right. I just don't know how they get away with that. It's a so-called hack job. Don't do that. Right? Be professional. Right? All right. But today we're going to take a look at some of the other things that you might encounter as uh, as part of your job. And uh, some of the most popular ones. Uh, by no means that's I'm showing you the whole thing. I, I just, we just want. There's no time in this course to show you everything and that's uh, that's the nature of the beast 
but some of the most po most popular ones would be security alarms, fire alarms, and surveillance. Now, fire alarm is a little bit uh, different than the other two, in a way that uh, you need additional licensing in order to um, do the uh, fire or install uh, or uh, troubleshoot or design um, or um, provide maintenance, like a regular annual maintenance uh, that has to do with the fire alarms. And though the fire alarms or fire uh, as a subject, um, well, it divides into different things. It's installations, it's maintenance, it's the uh, regular testing. Um, and it's also, it's not only just the fire alarms um, installations, it's also the fire extinguishing systems. So fire extinguishing systems that are, uh, that could be a, well, a permanently installed system as a kitchen system, kitchen extinguishing system or a fire suppression. Um, uh, and the kitchen systems are basically in, when there's that huge stove or the huge, uh, or the area where they have those burners uh, and where all the cooking takes place, could be hot plate, could be burners. Uh, there, is, there, there are some nozzles uh, and sensors right above that or in the vicinity of, the, of, of that area in order to suppress the fire in case uh, something gets out of control. So that's a permanent installation. Um, but also there are fire extinguishers, uh, the ones that you can see hanging on the walls. And uh, you know. So fire alarm is, uh, is a vast, vast field, but you do need additional licensing and you do need additional training. And uh, our college actually does provide that. So if you are interested in that kind of, uh, in this field, uh, let me know. Uh, and I'll point you in the right direction. Okay, there could be some additional courses that you might need to take, but it's a pretty, um, well, it, it's it's a good business to get into. You can actually support yourself pretty well uh, with uh, with being a fire alarm, well, technician, for example. Right, but we're going to start with security alarms. Let's take a look at some uh, some of the basics of how the security alarm is uh, is uh, installed and how it works. All right, so security alarm. Now here, uh, the posted lecture notes are already posted. Uh, so you can uh, you can actually open it up the PDF and download it or whatnot. There are a couple links here. Uh, this one talks about uh, uh, water detectors. Uh, this is about sensors. Uh, different types of keypads uh, and uh, some other things that have to do with the security and that will give you some sort of um, general overall picture of what uh, what this thing is all about because right? uh, fire alarms is sensors and the brains behind it the controller the the, the, the panel and of course there is also uh, a lot of uh, to do with something that's called a monitoring, uh, which means basically the fire alarm uh, goes off because something happened, um, usually a burglary, then this alarm is supposed to work a certain way. And communicating with something that's called a monitoring station uh, is part of the uh, you know, part of the alarm's job, if you can say it that way. All right, so let's take a look at some of that. Now, the here, <coughs> uh, there are different companies. Uh, uh, there is, some of the most popular would be the Paradox. Uh, there would be a DSC. Uh, there's the, the big companies. Now, also other companies such as ADT or Chubb or um, others, uh, they do have uh, their own proprietary systems and uh, the, but they mostly work uh, pretty much in you know, the basics of operation are the same. It's just how they are solved. Uh, they have put together and organized as far as hardware and software structure. Uh, they might vary uh, one way or the other because uh, every little system has a little bit different way of being put together. But let's take a look at some of the basics, what you can encounter uh, when dealing with uh, security alarms. This is an example of a main board. 
uh, if it were a computer, you would call it a motherboard. But uh, yeah, and some people do call it a motherboard, but uh, usually they would be called the main board uh, of a security alarm. Uh, well, you can see there's some sort of electronics going on. There's some connectors and peripherals, uh, peripheral connections uh, that need to be addressed. Right? Um, now, I have the general view of that, and I do have also the magnified uh, shots of this, uh, of these all the connectors and peripheral peripherals. Right? So here are some, well, in this case, a, a lot, actually. You're going to deal with those uh, screw terminals. Right? And you're going to have some of those uh, connectors that look like this. I'm not sure if you can... Uh, straight connectors uh, that, uh, well, f serve different purpose, and we're going to discuss some of those. Well, actually, most of them, if not all. Right? Uh, so here, this particular uh, main board consists of eight zones. You can see here, eight zones. Zone one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here is the COM. That stands for common. Right? Uh, basically, a zone is a circuit. It is com com capable of providing eight separate and separately addressable as far as functionality circuits like for example zone one you could assign to be the main door so what you would do is you would connect a wire coming out from zone one screw terminal right here going to a magnetic door contact which is basically an open close switch and normally it has to be closed, usually, that's what it is, which means that when the window or door is closed, the switch is closed. Uh, it uses something that usually the, the, the door contacts, and the door contacts are called door contacts, uh, whether you're installing them on windows or doors or any kind of things that coming together and go apart. Um, they are called door contacts. Okay, so the door contact is uh, something that's called a reed switch. A reed is just like the reed on the you know, clarinet or saxophone, which is a couple of uh, pieces together, and uh, when you introduce the air pressure through it, they vibrate. So that's called a reed, the mouthpiece of a saxophone or a clarinet. So that makes it, so they call the reed switches because they resemble that kind of stuff. They're a couple of uh, metal pieces that are close together, and when you bring a magnet in the close proximity, those th those those pieces of metal just uh, kind of like touch, um, become attached to each other, and that's how they close the switch and making a closed loop or uh, yeah the, cl the closed return path. So basically the zone would be in idle state if you just put a wire here from here to common so zone one to common zone two to common zone three to common and so on so the common terminals are conveniently placed so when you do your wiring you're not only using just one you can just uh, conveniently uh, place your wiring uh, as you go along uh, but this common and that common and that common they are the same point right? Okay, so if you just place a straight wire, or straight wire, you know, you're going to bend it, right? But uh, you're going to go from zone 1 to common, the zone is considered closed, and it's considered to be in idle state. Okay, well, so why not run a wire connected to a switch, or the read switch, or a dark contact switch, to one terminal, and from the other terminal, connected back to common. So when somebody closes the window, they bring the magnet close to the contact so you know the switch could be installed on the door frame and the magnet can be installed right on the door itself so when the door closes it brings a magnet in close proximity to the switch switch closes door is closed switch is closed everything is a-okay as far as the alarm system is concerned now when you open the door the magnet gets away from that switch and the switch opens that becomes an open circuit 
And two things can happen. If the alarm system is not armed, then it's going to give you some sort of indication on the keypad that that zone is open. And in the programming, if you name zone 1 as a main door, it's going to show you on the keypad that the main door is open. It's either going to be on the LCD display, you're going to see the text that the main door is open, or sometimes there are just uh, zone numbers uh, with LEDs, and uh, beside that there is a little piece of paper on the on the hinge, or the little flap on the keypad that explains uh, what uh, what each zone is. Now, uh, zone two, for example, you can well you can utilize to let's say for example living room windows. For example, just, just an example. So, notice I said windows, not a window. Because you want you only have so many zones, and you want to distribute the connections in a way that it makes sense. Uh, what do I mean by the way it makes sense? Well, for example, if you have three windows in the living room that open, you're not going to waste three zones for each window, unless this is something that you really, really want, and yes, you can do that. But usually what's being done is that from zone 2, for example, there's a wire and it goes to the contact of the first window. From the other terminal of that contact goes to the second contact on the second window. From that goes to the third contact on the third window and then it comes back here. So you have a one series connection uh, going there. And you can, in the software, in the programming, you can name that as living room windows. So as long as one window is open, the whole loop becomes open. And if the alarm is not armed, then it's just going to give you some indication. Now, if the alarm is armed, then depend, it depends on how you're going to program each zone. Because, uh, for example, if you have the parameter, windows would be considered a parameter. And like living room motion sensor would be called the indoor or inside sensors. So parameter or inside. Parameter is the sensors of the doors or windows that can lead in or out the house or the you know, commercial building. And the inside, you know, the interior sensors. Now, the interior sensors and the outside sensors can be programmed slightly different way. Uh, you have options on how you want the alarm system to react when the alarm is open, I mean, the alarm is armed and the zone is tripped. So, uh, for example, all the parameters, usually you want to have that um, alarm action to happen right away, instantly. Uh, except for the main door. Right? So, on the main door, you might program something that's called the entry delay. Because if you want to come home, you have to open the main door. But as soon as you open the main door, you don't want the alarm system to go with bells and whistles right away. Because that would just not make sense. Uh, you would be annoyed. Your neighbors would be annoyed. Uh, maybe some of the alarm signals would be sent to the monitoring station and that ties up their time because they're monitoring a lot of alarms all over the place. And uh, you know, that just would not make sense. So you want to have something like a, something that's called the entry delay uh, while disarming, which means you trip that zone and you have 30 seconds, usually 30 seconds is the entry delay, to punch the code on the keypad so uh, you can disarm before that uh, alarm system goes into alarm state. Yeah. Uh, also, on the entry zones, you can program that as you know, entry zone, uh, that's what it's called, and it, you can include an exit delay because, well, you want to close the doors, make sure everything is closed, otherwise the system will not let you arm. Right? Uh, then uh, you want to be able to punch the code to arm and then leave. You have to have some time to leave, so which means you're going to have to trip that zone, open the door and close it because you have to leave somehow. Right? Um, so then you're going to also have something that's called an exit delay. And the exit delay and entry delays are two different delays. 
uh, they're considered as two separate delays and you can enter in the software in the programming you can enter for example by default usually or you can change it if you want uh, the entry delay is you got 30 seconds to punch the code before it goes nuts uh, for the exit delay usually it's longer you have one minute to get out so you can open and close the door multiple times and but when that minute goes bang the system goes into armed state yeah. uh, so that's uh, the explanation of the zoning now there are different configurations which we'll talk about but usually it's just a closed loop you can have an open loop if you want and then make it close uh, or you can have a closed loop and make it open to react but usually by default it's a closed loop and you open it if you want the system to react uh, now there are some zones that are that can be programmed all the zones you can program any way you want uh, so we have an instant alarm we have you can put that on a delay or we can make it also 24 hour loop which means whether the alarm is armed or disarmed it doesn't matter if the zone trips the system goes into alarm state where would you want to do that why would you want to do that like for example if you have one of those zones connected to a smoke alarm right, to the smoke uh, sensor or a heat sensor which would be sort of like a fire kind of prevention uh, then uh, or a water sensor uh, like a flood sensor or a sump pump sensor if the sump pump uh, in your basement goes above the level that you want it can let you know uh, now those it just makes sense that they are active 24 hours seven days a week whether alarm is armed or is disarmed if there's a fire if there's a smoke if that zone is tripped the system is going to go into alarm mode and it's going to notify the monitoring station accordingly uh, send appropriate signal uh, and the, uh, the monitoring station also if you sign up with them you're going to have to give them the information on zone one is what zone two is what like for example this would be the main door let's say this would be the living room doors let's say this would be the inside motion sensors um, that could be uh, something else, a garage door, and things like that, right? Uh, so you do have something, you know, and you can combine sensors. If you have three motion sensors in the house, you can just say, you know, okay, uh, those three motion sensors I can put on one zone, just connect them in series. Uh, if you have uh, two or three glass break detectors, you can put those on the same zone and connect, let's say, zone five or whatever other zone, right? Uh, so uh, so that's uh, that's how those things work. So we have those zones. There could be entry zones, could be instant. So for example, if somebody opens a window, you don't want this thing to be on a delay. You can program that to be an instant alarm. As soon as the window is open, boom, there's no delay. This, it, the system goes into the uh, alarm zone. And of course, you don't want that, the windows, to be 24-7 uh, armed. You want that thing to be status dependent. So which means if you want to uh, uh, walk around the house and you have those zones uh, opening and closing as you trip the motion sensors, you don't want the alarm system to go into alarm because that would be, you know, just that would not make sense, right? Right. <laughs> um, so... Um, there's also different types of arming. One type of arming is just a regular arming. You leave the house, you put the system into arm. All the zones are in to the listening mode while the system is armed. But you can also um, arm the system in something that's called a stay mode, like stay at home, but it's called stay mode. And that's quite a useful feature <clears throat> most of the alarms have that all of them should have that right now um, stay arming is like for example you want to go to sleep at night usually people sleep at night right uh, you can stay arm the system 
which means all the inside sensors are not going to react. The alarm system is not going to react. It's going to bypass, it's going to ignore the inside motion sensors because sometimes you want to get up, uh, get out of bed, go to the fridge and have a glass of water. You don't want the alarm to trip. Right? But all the parameter zones like the uh, main entry, uh, the garage door, uh, the glass break sensors, the um, window sensors, anything, any sensor that, uh, that monitor any kind of possible entry from outside to inside, you want those to be armed. So you, you, you include some of the zones to be in the stay uh, mode, and some of them you exclude from the stay mode. And all the stay mode alarm, uh, sensor, the zones are going to be ignored when you stay arm. So you can arm the system in two different ways. You can do a regular arming, or you can punch extra couple of keys and stay arm. Okay. Uh, so that's the basics of things. Now, what else do we have here? We have something that's called auxiliary and a bus oh remember the bus topology that's where things come in place uh, auxiliary that's where the power dc power and uh, depending on the system but usually it's 12 volts dc that's where you get the power to power up active devices all right a magnetic door contact is a passive device. It does not require to be powered. But a motion sensor is something that has electronics in it. So it has to work somehow. It has to have some power. So to the motion sensor, you need four wires. You need a signal wire for the zoning to let you know what this thing is open. or It has a relay. The motion sensor does have internal relay that opens or closes depending on the condition. Normally it's closed when there's no motion going around, but when it senses motion, and it's just an infrared sensor, usually there are some different motion sensors, there are microwave uh, sensors, for example. Uh, but uh, usually it's like infrared. It senses your body heat. Uh, and the body heat has to move a certain way. Uh, so if you're just standing in motionless, it's not going to trigger the motion sensor. But if you move, it's going to sense that uh, that infrared heat that is produced by your body is going to move from one spot to another, and it doesn't take much. It's going to go into alarm. But those are active devices, motion sensors, for example, that need to have, have power, so you get Two wire, four wires, two for the signal and two for the power. So you get four wires. Usually you get red and black for the power and yellow and green for the for the zoning, um, the contact wire. Uh, the bus thing is um, it. It's a communication channel, just like the number we talked about the um, coaxial cable. We used uh, we we talked about the broadband uh, multiplexing or time base uh, time division multiplexing. Um, this is just almost like a I would say broadband type of communication because there's the bus and. For example, if you have a keypad, you need some information from the keypad to go back and forth between the main board and the keypad. So, you know, what to display and entries uh, when you press the key or when you press all kinds. So, the, so it's both, it's a two-way communication between the keypad. And if you have more than one keypad, then you connect the signal wires from the keypad to the bus. So it's just all the parallel connection, just like we connected the PA speakers, the constant voltage PA speakers. So that's why it's called a bus, because those keypads are connected to the main board in a bus configuration. And of course, every keypad is going to have to have power provided. Uh, there are some other active sensors that uh, in some in some cases, they 
instead of providing you the open or closed loop, they give you a signal that this thing, this this what this thing, the uh, zone was tripped, right? which also it will be connected to the bus. And how it is so? Uh, how is it that the system communicates? It uses uh, a form of a a form of a broadband uh, communication. Uh, moving to the left, the main thing that we have is the AC and the bell. So not always you're going to use these, but this here always have to. Well, this is where the system gets power from. It has to be powered. Okay. Um, well, usually it's like 24 volts DC, sorry, AC, and that's what the typical so-called a doorbell transformer is providing. Now, the, 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 the power transformer, 24 volt DC, it can be in the form of a uh, plug-in, which has those prongs that you plug into regular duplex receptacle, uh, and you get screw terminals coming out, uh, and you just bring the... AC connection, 24 volts AC into that, and that's how the system is powered. Also, when we talk about powering system, it will have a backup battery somewhere, and in this main board, this is where the backup battery is going. It's a rechargeable battery that uh, well, looks like a gray cube. Um, and it's sitting inside the main box where the main board is. If the power gets cut off, you lose the power, then you still have a little bit of power in the battery that hopefully is going to last long enough before the power comes back on. Now, how long is the battery going to last? Usually you get a lot of clients asking you that question. You can never tell. Depending on how many active devices you have installed, depending on the draw that they're going to, uh, how much current they're going to draw. And the more devices you have connected that are active, the more keypads, the more motion sensors, the more, more glass break sensors you have, the more power it's going to draw from the backup battery and the less time it's going to last. Uh, but usually you got something close to anywhere between an hour or two uh, for, you know, uh, for the backup battery to last. And then when the backup battery discharges, then yeah, okay, you know, that thing does go well, um, offline. So there are other ways of keeping the power. Uh, UPS is one of the uh, ways. UPS is called uninterrupted power supply, uh, and those last usually longer. So you can you can also have that. What else do we have here? Um, Bell. Bell is a another way to call a siren. You have to have some audio kind of feature. Well, sometimes you don't have to. You can have a silent alarm and just being monitored by a monitoring station so the burglar can trip the alarm not even knowing about it, right? And then, whoop, you know, there's the police shows up, right? Um, so, but usually you want some, uh, some uh, noisemaker uh, to let you know that the alarm has tripped. Um, so, bell. Uh, that's what's called bell. Uh, now, <clears throat> you can see plus or minus because there is no audio signal coming out. When the alarm trips, 12 volts, in this case, appears on that, which powers up the siren, and the, power, the siren, once it receives 12 volts, it is made to make that noise. So that's how as simple as that. Program and relay contacts. You have different program outputs, and they work in a different way in different scenarios or in different brands, in different uh, models. But program is, you can assign, this one has four program outputs. You can assign 
each program to react certain way uh, based on whatever condition. So you can program program number one to not react if nothing happens. You can program that to react if the system is armed and send a signal somewhere else to some other device. You can program that to react when the system is armed, uh, goes into alarm state and whatnot. You can program that to react if a zone is stripped, if the door, uh, if the alarm is not armed. There's, you know, it can be programmed to a chime, for example, you know, the store entrance. You want things to be chiming, char chiming, when uh, when the somebody a client walks through the uh, front door. Uh, so the chime can be connected to the some external device that can do whatever, um, like usually make some noise or maybe flash a light or something. Um, but also the keypads have the chiming feature as well. So you can in the keypad you can turn on the chime on whatever chosen zones. So usually the businesses, they want the chime to be activated on the main entry. And maybe uh, if there is a back entry as well. Uh, if somebody walks through the back door, uh, they want uh, also the keypad to notify it. So there's like a little beep, 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 beep kind of a thing. Right? So uh, there are different ways of... Uh, now, relay, it's also just like a program, but it's a dry contact relay. Um, and you can see there's a common, normally closed, normally open. Um, you can also assign the relay contact to react in a certain way based on the condition. Arm, disarm, alarm, or zone tripped. Usually that's, uh, these are the usual conditions here. They work slightly different way. These are dry contacts, which means they are independent of anything. Um, so you can connect whatever you want to that. Uh, usually acts like a switch to turn something on, something bigger maybe. And these here, um, quite often they are just hanging in the air and if it's tripped, then it just connects itself into the ground. Uh, which means that you can have something else connected to the auxiliary. Yeah. And... Um, things are going to well, power up something. Or you, uh, sometimes those are programmed to give you a voltage on it. it. You have to find out what it is by either reading the manual on this particular system that you're going to use or maybe calling tech support. Those alarm systems, they do come with tech support. Live, you can call them. What else do we have here? We have a communicator. Look at this. Tip and ring. Does it remind you of something? Ah, like a telephone. Pods. Telephone lines. Um, less and less often, but still, telephone pods telephone line is being used to provide the communication with the outside world. How does it work? You can see here's a tip and ring, and here's a tip one and ring one. How does that work? What's the idea of this? Well, when you have a telephone line coming into the house, you cut that off from the rest of the phones, you go right to the demarcation point, which is the point of entry. And you grab that connection as it enters the house before it splits into anything else. And you connect that tip and ring phone line into this tip and ring here. Tip and ring. Then you grab the tip one and ring one from here and you connect that to the rest of the house. The idea is that if there is an alarm condition and this pro system is programmed to use the telephone line, it is going to steal the telephone line from the rest of the house so we can use it because at that time this here alarm is the most important thing it 
doesn't matter if somebody's having some conversation about something, or maybe the burglar would come home and just take the phone off hook. Uh, so there's a dial tone. So that communicator is going to disconnect everything else, is going to steal the line, is going to hang up and pick up, or it's just like going, you know, pick up the headset, but internally here, dial the number to the monitoring station, communicate with the monitoring station, hang up and release the line back to the rest of the house. So that's the idea of that. Now, quite often right now, what we get is, here is the, um, where is the, here we go. Here is a serial connection. Now, the serial connection can be used to connect a serial interface to go into your laptop. So if you want to use the software to program the alarm. Or it can be used to connect something that's called IP module, Internet Protocol module. It's a very small module, connects to here. It has a straight connector to connect to here. And the other side of the IP module has just a RJ45 or the Ethernet uh, jack to which you plug in the Ethernet cord and the other end of the Ethernet cord you plug into your modem, router, switch, whatever your setup is. And then of course you have to uh, do a whole bunch of setup in the programming and you have to have uh, you know, uh, with the monitoring station, you need to um, get a bunch of information from them so you can input that into the software so the system can communicate through internet with the monitoring station. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's another way of communicating. Because a lot of people, uh, a lot of facilities, they don't have um, parts lines anymore. But pretty much everybody has internet, so there you go. And just looking around, here is just a, a memory um, maintain, maintenance battery. and just a watch battery, just to keep the programming, um, the time. And that usually lasts, you know, five, six years before it has to be replaced. Um, of course, it has a f this fuse here. Uh, it uh, has to do with the backup battery. If the battery is going bad and it short circuits, so it, just so you don't burn the rest of the circuitry, the fuse is going to uh, trip. Um, or if you plug in, you can see here's the red and black, for example, for this one, you have to plug in the red and black from the battery and appropriate, uh, um, well, in a appropriate uh, positioning. Uh, polarity has to be followed the same. Otherwise, you're going to connect the battery back, uh, backwards and boom, it's going to be overload, current overload. That will be wrong. And the fuse is going to protect the rest of the circuitry here. So that's as far as the some of the main board features. Um, all these here are just uh, the magnifications of what we uh, that's what the battery here looks like. That's what they look like. Uh, so I just was able to zoom in on the presentation, so I'm not going to go back and explain those things again. But uh, they're there for you to look. Here's the battery backup, as I said. Now, as far as um, security alarm sensors, here is the passive door contact. The door contact can be mounted or installed in two different ways. One is just a straight connection. Here's the zone, whatever zone one, zone two, or whatever. And we're not using the auxiliary power because it's a passive, you know, it doesn't require power. It just has a switch that opens or closes. And here's the magnet that makes the switch open or close. And you can just connect straight to the wire. And usually, that by default, that's the system. That's how systems are programmed to watch for that closed or open loop. Sometimes you're going to uh, install something that's called the end of line resistor. So you put the resistor in series with the zone, and the zone 
is going to look for that resistor's resistance in order to think that everything is okay. If anything happens, then uh, others than that resistance, then the system is going to react. So usually you're going to have that end of line resistor a little bit past that. So uh, just go make a loop and have it and then just bring it back. So it looks like it's just an op, uh, just a closed loop. So if somebody shorts that and the resistor is a little bit past, hidden, then um, you're going to produce a short. System is going to react. If you open it, you're going to have an open circuit. System is going to react. So sometimes, sometimes, some of the zones, you can have both of those. And you can have it programmed so both of these are going to be connected to the same zone. This time, this type connection and that type connection, the same zone, and you can program that to recognize as two different zones. That's how you can double up the zoning. So from a uh, zone board, you can have a 16 zone board. <coughs> Usually, I would not recommend that because, well, sometimes there are some funny things are happening. The system being, things are not being recognized the way they should, you know, but, uh, but some people like it. As far as the motion sensor, that's what the motion sensor looks like inside. This is the typical paradox motion sensor, but DSCs and other ones, they pretty much work the same. Unless you have one that's like a digital one, then uh, you don't have the um, zone sensor. You just have the bus connection and just communicates with the, with the alarm system, sending a signal. Uh, when you see these screw terminals here, that's what you see. Here is 12 volts. And here is the ground. Usually that's when you use the Z cable, which is Z4, Z8. Z4 has four wires. And notice the color coding. Remember that red and green, black and yellow? Well, we use that a little bit different. We use the black and red to provide the power to devices. And we use the, usually we use the green for the signal, which would be connected to the zone, and the and the green would be connected to the common. Okay. Um, and usually you just have that normally closed. So when there is no motion, the system is idling, these two are closed, normally closed. You also have normally open, but sometimes you don't even have a possibility of connection. It's just that screw terminal is not there. Sometimes there is. Also, what is not connected here is the temper switch. And the temper switch, in this case, is right here. It's a spring-loaded switch. When the cover goes back on, the cover goes on, there's a little kind of a dimple in there that presses that switch into a closed position. If you take the cover that little pressing thing is going to be away from that switch, taken away from that switch, and the switch is going to be released into open position. And you can connect that in series with the zoning, which is going to make the alarm trip. Sometimes those are connected, sometimes they're just left alone. Uh, <clears throat> security alarm zone, that's how it works. Here's the zone. Um, and I just put that security alarm contact point. Okay. <laughs> um, so here's, let's say this is the common. And here is the wiring that goes to the sensors. We put things in series. Let's say this is window one, window two, window three. Before you leave, you close all the windows. All of them are closed. You get the closed loop. If, as soon as one of the windows opens, bang, there is a, you know, uh, a lot of noise or the alarm goes into uh, alarm mode. Before I let you go, 
I'm just going to show you the wiring that is uh, involved. It's called Z wire. And you see, I put no twist. No, no, no. You see, I always put a great emphasis on having twist with the data signaling. With the alarm system, we want no twist. It just actually works the other, it works against us to have a twist. We want an untwisted straight pair. The reason for that is that if you have a twist, the twist acts like an inductor, acts like a coil. Coils hate change. So if you have a twisted wire, twisted pair as a signal, you open and close the door very fast, and if the wire is long enough, that inductor, that coil, might actually prevent the signal from getting through to the main panel. Uh, so that's why we have straight wires in the alarm system. Sensors. What do we have? Motion sensors, door sensors, glass break sensors, smoke alarms, heat uh, alarms, water level, seismic, it's uh, the, the react to vibrations. Uh, usually they will be installed in, on, on a safe in the banks if somebody wants to drill into a safe, so that's going to sense the vibrations. Panic alarms. Uh, in retail, quite often used or some sensitive areas, you can press the panic and it's going to trigger a silent alarm. And sensors could be wired, could be wireless. Annunciators. Bell would do the siren, strobe lights, it could be also silent alarms with just um, communication going on to the monitoring station. Control, we can control the systems through keypads, laptops, IP modules, remote access. So if you have an IP module, you can connect that thing to the internet, you can access that through, you know, some of the companies way back, you know, well, no way back, but way uh, like, some remote locations like east or far west, far north. Um, the technician has a huge area to service. And if there's certain, just a simple thing as changing some programming or something like that, uh, you don't have to drive 200 kilometers to, to do some programming change. You can just log in uh, from your facility and uh, do those changes. So remote access control. And there's wireless remote controls. Yes, those alarms come with wireless uh, remote controls. Uh, so you can go to bed and press a key on your remote control and you can arm the whole system. Yeah. Interfacing. Access control. Um, access control is the... You see those, you have to swipe the card to enter the room. Those alarm systems also can be interfaced with that and they can, they can work in conjunction with it. it. They can also be connected to fire alarms. Fire alarm can let the alarms, the security alarm, know that it's stripped, um, and uh, that security alarm can use the monitoring to send the signal. Monitoring stations, the alarms do not get connected to a police station anywhere. No, it's the they go. They are connected to some facilities or businesses that are called monitoring stations. They contact the police if there's need to. Right. And here's my favorite, others, okay? Uh, all right, so uh, 54 passive devices, uh, door contacts, which is, you know, window contacts, overhead garage door contacts, surface mount or flash mount. Surface mount is the little device that goes on the frame, you can see it. Flash mount, it goes inside the frame and you can't see it when the door is closed. Some pump sensors, very, very useful ones. Um, that's your safety, the sump pump level, water level goes too high, it can trip the sensor, which is monitored 24-7, and if you're not home, the monitoring station is going to get notified, and they're going to call you, and you can just, uh, you know, take action, whatever you need. And my favorite, others, active devices, keypads, expansion boards, motion sensors, glass break detectors, water sensors, and here's my favorite, others. Next time we meet in person, which will be tomorrow, ask me to explain how the motion sensor works and how the glass break detector, sensor, detector works. And we're going to continue with the fire alarms and the surveillance. Uh, and if we have time, we're going to do some more. Right. Cool. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will see you when I see you. Have a good one, guys.